And uh, good morning to everyone watching online or on Channel 44 with us. Hey, I trust you had a fantastic Christmas and uh, enjoyed uh, being together with family and friends. We're talking about a triumphant peace today. Peace on earth has been the message of this series. And, uh, and the final message we've called a triumphant peace. And uh, as has already been referred to, this is the uh, end of the year, our last service of 2020, and what a year it's uh, been. You know, church is always, it seems to be at the end of the year or beginning of the year, we're always talking about reflections on the year that was or looking to the year ahead. And I remember being here 12 months ago, actually, and... Uh, I remember we had a a, a couple of pastors visiting from our uh, CFC South Church and Pastor Dan Pizerlak was here and uh, Dan, his wife and Serenity, they have quite a large family. At that point it was five kids and um, and I remember having a prophetic word for Dan. I said, Dan, I reckon God's going to use you and influence you and bless you this year and so get ready if you expand the tents of your whatever it was. And I said, I don't know what that means. Maybe baby number six is on the way. And I said it jokingly. Well, a month later. <laughs> You've got to be careful what you prophesy over people because uh, a month later, Serenity uh, announced that she was having baby number six. So, um, so I've got to be careful on that. But what a year it's been, hey? Can you? I mean, nobody would have expected the year that we've had. We were all talking about, well, what are the 2020s going to be like? We're stepping into this new decade. And uh, I don't think any of us could have imagined. It's a bit like one of those experiences where it's like we look at each other and go, what just happened? You ever had one of those where it just feels like your whole world's been thrown upside down and kind of shaken up a bit? And the result is you kind of feel like everything's changed, everything's shifted. Nothing's going to be the same again. You know what I'm talking about? It's a bit like Dorothy in The Wizard of Oz, isn't it? You know? One minute she's in black and white, the next minute she's in colour. It's like, wow, the whole world's changed and she's dancing around with munchkins. You think, what just happened? It's that kind of experience. You know, I think as we reflect on 2020 and we prepare to step into 21, I think our reflections maybe look a little bit different this year. And as uh, we've been sharing over the last couple of weeks, yeah, there's been a lot of fear around this year fear of what's going to happen in the future there's been terror there's been uncertainty you know there's been a lot of hatred vented across our world in in different shapes and forms over the last uh, 12 months and you know when we focus on those things it can it can leave us feeling quite uh, deflated and defeated and less than victorious But here's the good news, folks. Jesus is still on the throne. Amen? Jesus is still on the throne. He is the bringer of triumphant and lasting peace. At the end of what we might call a COVID crazy year, Jesus is reminding us he has still overcome the world. He is still in charge. And this year has not taken him by surprise. Might have taken us by surprise. But when we step back and we look at things, we see Jesus' hand at work in all things, even in circumstances which, uh, you know, we kind of leave us reeling and thinking, well, what was that all about? Jesus understands. And so as we, I guess, remember those things stepping into 2021, uh, that's the mindset we've got to have, knowing that Jesus is in control that when we, our life is uh, uh, firmly planted in him, uh, our feet are on the rock, everything is safe. And uh, we're going to look at a passage of scripture this morning from John chapter 20. So if you've got a Bible, you can flick open to John 20 or we'll have the key verses on screen. But I love this account of John's gospel or from John's gospel where Jesus appears to his disciples after his resurrection. And they were pretty fearful at this particular point in time. And I think it's such a relevant passage for all Christ followers 
who, uh, who live in fearful and anxious times. And so we're going to have a look at that this morning. I think it's good to consider, actually, uh, the circumstances that the disciples were in. And if you think about what they had been through in a very short period of time, I mean, the, just the previous seven days, you think about it, a week beforehand, they arrive in Jerusalem with Jesus, and it was all palm waves flying and people uh, singing Hosanna and uh, they were praising Jesus as the Messiah as they came into town. Do you know the story? I mean, they must have been feeling elated by that. Um, I think they would have felt pretty confronted. The Pharisees were always there in the background, agitating, trying to work out how they were going to trip up Jesus and making their threats. I think there would have been feelings of betrayal. One of their friends, one of their closest, Judas, had betrayed Jesus and sold him out to the Pharisees. They would have been feeling betrayal. Uh, there was some, definitely some feelings of denial. We know Peter, uh, who was always you know, the first to put up his hand, say, oh, I'll never leave you, Jesus. I'll always be there by your side. And of course, he was the first one to, to disappear and deny Jesus when someone said to him, hang on, aren't you that, that uh, bloke that hangs around with Jesus? No, not me. And, uh, and so he took off. In fact, all the disciples took off. All except John. John was the only one who uh, stayed by Jesus' side through his crucifixion. There would have been bitter disappointment. I mean, you, imagine you, you've, the friend has just been killed, murdered really, uh, uh, in a terrible way on a cross. Their friend, the Messiah, and they're thinking, well, we had these hopes and dreams. We were following him for the long haul. What's going on here? There would have been grief. And there would have been deep, deep fear of being treated the same just by association. So they're at this point of going, what do we do? They're just paralyzed, really. It's like, what, what do we do next? And so they end up gathering and they lock themselves in a room. Sound familiar? The first lockdown. They lock themselves in a room. They don't know what else to do. They're just like, well... And I think they just sort of spent those three days. Yeah, they're reflecting, but they're kind of getting lost in their reflection, I would think. They're just looking at each other going, what just happened? What comes next? Because their whole world had been tipped upside down. A week ago, there they are. They're committed to following Jesus for the rest of their life. But now it looks like Jesus is gone. All of that's over. What are we going to do? We have to go back to the old life. Peter's thinking, well, I guess I'm going to have to go back fishing. James and John might have been going, well, we're going to have to go back to Dad and tell him, well, we're, we're coming back again. And I don't think Dad was too chuffed when we took off in the first place. In other words, they're starting to picture their lives without Jesus. They don't know what to do. Now, we know all of that changes because the next thing that happens is Jesus shows up. But here's what we can learn uh, in 2021 from the disciples. If your reflections on the past are controlled by fears, you're never going to step into the wonderful future that Jesus has planned for you. Yeah? If your reflections on the past are controlled by fear, you're never going to step into the wonderful future Jesus has for you. And this was just the beginning for the disciples. And friends, it's the beginning for us too. As we step into 2021, God has good things for us. Each and every one of us here. He has good things for you. And I trust that you believe that and receive it this morning. So, what can we learn from the, the disciples' encounter with Jesus? Well, the first thing is that uh, we know that we now have Jesus' real presence. We have Jesus' real presence. You might remember a couple of weeks ago, Pastor Bill used the example of Caesar Augustus and the, the power that as a Caesar he uh, held in that time. Uh, 
and uh, that he'd, he'd uh, come up with the, the Pax Romana, which means Roman peace, and that there was peace to an extent in Rome at that time, although it was still quite uh, volatile and violent towards the, the Christians because they were then persecuted throughout the first and second centuries. Um, Caesar was a man. He lived, he died. But Jesus is alive. Augustus lived to be 77 years of age. On his deathbed, they say his last words were, did I play my part well? Well, if so, then applaud my exit. And to him, that was it. It was like, job done, I've done my bit, life is over. But when you compare that with Jesus, who when he was on the cross, he uttered, it is finished. He wasn't talking about his life. He, that was just beginning. He was talking about the old promises, the old covenant. They were gone, and a new promise of eternal life for all who believe had begun. So let's have a look at this uh, scripture, John 20, and starting from verse 19. It says, On the evening of that first day of the week, so this is Sunday, Jesus crucified on the Friday, resurrected Sunday morning. It's now Sunday evening. When the disciples were together, with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, they were really, really afraid. They'd locked themselves in. It says, Jesus came and stood among them. And I don't know how you, you picture this. Uh, it doesn't say Jesus banged on the door or, you know, Jesus was asking around, where are the, you know, where's the guys? It just says Jesus came and stood among them. I don't think he supernaturally, you know, floated through a wall like a ghost or anything, but it's like, again, we've got a picture. The guys are just kind of looking at each other going, what's, what's going on? And then all of a sudden, hang on, Jesus, you're here. <laughs> what's going on? So this is like, you know, he would have been freaking them out a little bit. It says, Jesus came and stood among them and he said, peace be with you. What a wonderful message, eh? Not only do we have that feeling of peace, but we have Jesus' presence in our lives. You know what it's like to have a, a, a presence watching you? you? You know when somebody is watching you, you don't you? You just have a feeling that, uh, that someone is watching you. I went to visit uh, family yesterday, just dropping some stuff off, and uh, I got back in the car, and as I'm looking down the driveway, there's nobody around. I just suddenly have this feeling I'm being watched. The rest of the family have gone inside. There's nobody around. But I feel like I'm being watched. And I look down. I see these two little eyes underneath the, the garden fence. It was my niece's dog. Longing to be running down the street because a very naughty dog takes off at any chance it gets. And I could just see these two beady little eyes watching me under the fence. I sense this presence. Hey. We've just had a, a Christmas time where, where loved ones weren't able to travel from interstate or you know what it's like sometimes when you've lost a loved one throughout the year and you look around the table and it's very obvious. You feel it straight away, don't you? Oh, grandma's not here. Grandpa's not here. Auntie or uncle's not here. You feel that their presence uh, is missed. And although, of course, we have a hope in, in Jesus for those who have passed on to, to heaven, that, that experience can be sad, it can be filled with grief, it might even be filled with trauma for some people, which is less than peaceful. And that's what the disciples were going through at this point in time. They were really grieving. What they had experienced was traumatic. And so that's probably what they're feeling before Jesus enters the room and then suddenly they're aware of his presence it's like oh he is here and that's what Jesus resurrection means for us it means we have his presence still today we have his peace with us we have an eternal hope in this life and the life that's to come it's the embodiment of his name we talk about it at Christmas all the time don't we Emmanuel God is with us God is with us. And I trust that you believe that. Let me ask you, are you aware of his presence? We need to, sometimes we talk about practicing the presence of God. That's why we do the, the, the life journal. 
Because daily you can be reading in the scriptures and saying, Jesus, what are you saying to me through this each day? And we've got some stuff planned to, to link in with our sermons this year, which is uh, really great. And there's something about when we're all on the same page, reading the same thing, and, and then growing together and saying, oh, what did you get out of Psalm 1 today? Oh, well, I got saw this. Oh, well, I saw this. And, and we learn together so much more. Jesus' presence is real. So that's the first thing. The second thing is we now know the meaning of Jesus' painful scars. We know the meaning of his painful scars. See, Rome killed Jesus. Well, they tried to kill Jesus. But God used his death to bring new life to our lost and sin-soaked world. In the next verse, after Jesus has arrived, after he's given that message, peace be with you, after he said that, he shows them his hands and his side, which were pierced. And it says the disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. <clears throat> In other accounts of this, we know about doubting Thomas, don't we? You know, Jesus appears, but not everybody believes it's Jesus. So, hang on, what's going on here? I don't believe, you know, people don't come back from the dead. And, uh, and so that we know that Thomas, particularly, had to see the scars. He had to see Jesus' hands. He had to see Jesus' side. And that's why today, I think if Jesus turned up here today, if Jesus just walked in the door, he would still look like a 33-year-old Jewish-Palestinian man with scars on his hands and scars on his side. Why? Because they're a reminder of what he endured on the cross for us. Some of us might be carrying scars. Yes, the last 12 months has been difficult. There might be some things that you're carrying from that. We know that there's been financial upheavals and job loss for some people. Not being able to visit people into family, interstate, or travel. Those things have been difficult. Maybe there are some more deep-seated scars that we carry. Things from relationship breakdowns or painful shame and, and, and secrets that, that we've just carried for a long, long time. I think of a, a verse in Isaiah 54 where it says, Fear not, you will no longer live in shame. Don't be afraid. There is no more disgrace for you. If there are things that you have carried, particularly for a long time, receive this verse this morning. Don't be afraid. There is no more disgrace. You will no longer remember the shame of your youth and the sorrows of widowhood. In other words, no matter what it is that you feel like you are carrying, you don't need to fear or be afraid that those things will bind you and stop you from moving forward. They won't when you place yourself in Jesus' love and receive that. Jesus went to the cross. He bore those painful scars so that we don't have to. And I love in Romans 8 where it says, what we suffer now is nothing compared to the glory he will reveal to us later. Do you know what? It's inevitable. We will go through difficult times. Sometimes people think, oh, I've become a Christian, everything's you know, coming up roses now, everything's good, everything's fine. No, we still go through difficult circumstances, but when we're doing it life together with Jesus, he carries us through those things to eternity. And the scars of the cross remind us of that. So we know the meaning of those painful scars. Well, then the third thing is we can now experience Jesus transforming peace. This is the important bit. We can now experience that transforming peace. The Pax Romana, Roman peace, it didn't last. It might have lasted a season, but it didn't last. And it's true with all kingdoms throughout history. If you're a history buff and you like following different uh, stories and dynasties and, and whatever. When you think about it, whether it's good leaders or bad leaders throughout history and what they achieved, none of them succeeded in the eternal global reach that Jesus has. You think about the Caesars of Rome. Rome fell. 
the Khans of Mongolia. We, we hear about Genghis Khan and, and Kublai Khan. I didn't know a great deal about them. I was reading up on them this, this week. A dynasty in, in uh, Mongolia that lasted maybe some 400 years, which is a significant period of time. Um, but ultimately, those, those kingdoms fell. You think of evil dictators of, of the last 100 years or so, Hitler, Stalin, Mao Zedong, the, the influence and the millions of lives that were lost because of the evil actions uh, of these people. You think of peacemakers, good men like Gandhi or, or Martin Luther King, whose message was essentially uh, a, a peaceful one. Their influence might have been significant, but it only lasts a season. But Jesus' peace is still expanding, and it will conquer all the worlds of man through his irresistible love and grace. And it's still expanding today, rapidly. Look at this again in, in the, the next verse. So once Jesus has got their attention, he's convinced them, hey guys, it's me. He says, uh, he brings his message again, he goes, Guys, peace be with you. It's as if they don't get it the first time, you know, and, and which is not unlike the disciples. We know that sometimes they had to hear these things two or three times. Um, I know sometimes I have to hear these things two or, two or three times before I get them. Um, when you really get who Jesus is and what he is about, it transforms you with a peace that is beyond our understanding. See, it's like a gift, and you have to receive it. We've just had Christmas, wonderful gift-giving time. Uh, imagine if we all, you know, imagine if I went round to, to, to Philip's house on Christmas Day, and I gave, gave you all these presents, and I, I wrapped them beautifully, and I got big bows on, and Philip goes, oh, wow, thank you so much. And then he just shoves them to one side and doesn't look at them. That's not the purpose of a gift, is it? The purpose of a gift is to open it, to receive it, and to use it. And that's what we have to do with the peace that comes from God. Have a look at this. I love this verse in Philippians chapter 4, and we've talked about this a few times this year. Such a great verse. Chapter 4 and verse 6 says, Don't worry about anything. What? <laughs> that's hard enough in itself, isn't it? Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. The antidote to worry is prayer, to bring everything to the foot of the cross and, and uh, leave it with Jesus. Tell God what you need and thank him for all he has done. Then you will experience God's peace. As we bring things to God in prayer and we thank him for what he's done, then we experience his peace, which, it goes on and says, which exceeds anything we can understand. So even when you're going through tough times and you're like, I don't get this, why is this happening? You can still be at peace with the Lord and know that he is in charge. And it says here, his peace will guard your heart and your mind. In other words, your thoughts and your feelings. Because they can go a bit rogue on us when we're going through traumatic, difficult times, when we've experienced the kind of 12 months that we've had. I mean, I've sat and listened to some people, uh, you know, their philosophies on, on uh, what's happening in our world today. And I'm like, wow, is that what you see? I don't see it that way. We need to guard our heart and our mind with the peace of God as we live in Christ Jesus. Wow. And so I don't think the disciples were quite getting it. We can miss it too, but they did get it eventually. Receive his peace. And you can do that this morning at the close of our service. We're going to have a time of communion before we finish up this morning. And I'm going to pray that you receive that transformative peace of God, that as you seek after him, as you pray, as you bring your life to the foot of the cross again, you would receive his peace. And finally, the fourth thing here, we can now receive Jesus ministering power it's not just about what jesus does in us there is no political power or philosophical idea or educational method or religious work that can change human nature only jesus can do that through the power of his holy spirit 
and I don't know a truer word. Only Jesus can transform us through the power of his spirit. Look at the challenge that he gave to the disciples here. So in verse 21, John 20, verse 21, As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, it says he breathed on them. And he said, receive the Holy Spirit. Beautiful imagery of the Holy Spirit. And then he said, if you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. And if you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Wow. In other words, Jesus is not only breathing on us and giving us the Holy Spirit, but he's also giving us a mandate to go out and to share the gospel with those in our world. And he wants us to do the same. He wants us to minister to other people. We know that in other accounts of this same story in the other gospels, for example, Matthew 28, it says, Jesus came and told his disciples, I've been given all authority in heaven and in earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And we call that the Great Commission. And it still applies today. That is Jesus' message for us. He wants us to continue going out, making disciples of people. That's why we're sowing into the Bethel Center, into the lives of those missionaries there. Because we see the potential for those people going out, sharing the gospel powerfully. We need a revival in our hearts personally. And then as we share that with the people around us, we see Jesus' love and grace and mercy and his peace at work in the lives of others. And it's powerful. And you might say, oh, well, I don't know. I haven't, haven't got it in me. Jesus, when he transforms you on the inside, your very life becomes a testimony of what he is doing in you. And each and every one of us here is capable of then sharing that with others around us. People will see it in you and will call it out. And I want to encourage you as you step into 21, those of you maybe you've been uh, Jesus followers for a long time, but you just, oh gee, I struggle to share about my faith with others. Pray that he gives you the words. Pray that he gives you the opportunities. Loved ones who you have been praying for for a long time. Continue to pray for them and expect that God is going to open doors and open opportunities. Can you say amen to that? We have good things coming up in not just this next year, but the years ahead. And God is good. As I bring this to a close, we can walk into 2021 confident in his goodness, his faithfulness, and his commitment to us, and his purposes throughout his whole worldwide church. Yeah, this year might have shaken us a little bit, but God's promises and his power is eternal. He's still sending us into a lost and broken world, desperately in need of his peace and grace and unfailing love. He wants us to refuse to fear the future, not be bound like slaves to our fear, but go into next year knowing the peace of his presence is with us and is in us. And through us, he wants us to continue to minister life and peace and hope to many, many others. Let's bow our heads in prayer. I want to lead you in a prayer now. And this is an opportunity for you to respond to Jesus. Oh Lord, we thank you because even in spite of some of the circumstances we have faced and endured this year, Lord, we know that you are still king. You are sovereign. You are on the throne. Your presence is with us. Your promises never fail us. The scars that you bore on your body are a reminder of your eternal love and forgiveness for us. So Lord, we receive all that you have for us from your spirit, 
from your word. Lord, minister to each and every one of our hearts here this morning as we prepare to finish this year and step into the next year. Lord, show us all the good things you have for us. Stir our hearts and minds at the possibilities that you have for us. Opportunities to witness to our family and our friends, those who are lost, those who are around us. Thank you, Lord. We rededicate our lives to you afresh this day. In Jesus' name. Amen.